Wow, a lot of books in two smaller ones. <laughs> we have another podium. This quarter, as we begin, is going to be studying the book of Romans. Um, we just finished the book of Galatians. It was a fantastic study. I hope that you guys took to heart what was brought out in that whole complete study. Uh, raise your hand if you need a quarterly. Ricky will pass them out. Anybody else need a quarterly? Rosa does. Five hundred years ago this month, Martin Luther, a 33-year-old theology professor, posted his 95 thesis, and although he was seeking at first merely to refute a papal charlatan who was milking Luther's flock by selling indulgences, you know what that guy's name was? Starts with a T? Tetzel? You ever heard of that guy? Luther's act of defiance became the spark that ignited the Protestant Reformation. And the world has never been the same since. Of course, much has changed since that day in 1517. But what has not changed is the Word of God and the truths in the Word that gave Luther the theological foundation to challenge Rome and to deliver to millions the great message of salvation by faith alone. Central to that foundation is our study for this quarter, and that is the book of Romans. Luther wrote in his commentary on Romans, the epistle is really the chief part of the New Testament and the very purest gospel. And it's worthy not only that every Christian should know it. He doesn't end there. He actually says every Christian should know it word for word. Wow. By heart. Wow. By heart. But occupy himself with it every day as the daily bread of the soul. Yes, it was in Romans that Luther found the great truth of justification by faith alone. It was here that this man, struggling with the assurance of salvation, uncovered the great truth, not just of Romans, not just of the New Testament, but of the entire Bible, the truth about the plan of salvation, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, 2 Timothy 1.9. And it is the truth that salvation is found only in the righteousness of Christ. This righteousness is credited to us by faith, a righteousness granted to us apart from the keeping of the law, or as Paul so clearly expressed it in Romans, in Romans 3.28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. It was in regard to this truth too that Luther, defying the powers and principalities of the world, and of the Roman hierarchy appeared before the deed of Worms in 1521 and declared, I cannot and I will not retract, for it is unsafe for a Christian to speak against his conscience. How different is our world today from his? In his world, conscience was everything. In our world, conscience is nothing. Wow. Think about that. Think about how the world works today. And he made this great statement, here I stand, I can do no other. Today, faithful Protestants also can do nothing other than stand on the word of God, amen? amen. Over and against all umbilical traditions and dogma. Thus, there is no question that Christianity has advanced greatly since Luther, freeing itself from centuries of superstition and false doctrine that not only distorted the gospel, but in fact, also usurped it. Yet over the long years, the Reformation stalled. In some places, the progress was replaced by a cold formalism. In others, people actually turned back to Rome. And now, in an age of ecumenism and pluralism, many of the distinctive truths that spurred the Reformation have become blurred, covered up under a fusillade of semantic chicanery that seeks to hide fundamental differences that have not been resolved no more now than they were in Luther's day. I love how he wrote that. The prophecies of Daniel, 
chapter 7, verses 20 through 25, chapters 8, verses 9 through 12, and Revelation 13 and 14, as well as the great news of salvation by faith as found in the book of Romans, show why those faithful to the Bible must adhere firmly to the truths that our Protestant forefathers defended, even at the cost of their own lives. We are Seventh-day Adventists, and we rest upon the principle of sola scriptura. You know what that means? Yeah. Bible, Bible. Scripture alone. Hence, we adamantly reject all attempts to draw Christians back to Rome and to pre-Reformation faith. On the contrary, Scripture points us in the opposite direction, Revelation 18.4. And in that direction, we proceed as we proclaim the everlasting gospel is found in Revelation 14.6. To the world, the same everlasting gospel that inspired Luther 500 years ago. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, let's look at verses 1 through 4. Diana, can you read verses 1 and 2? Ricky, can you read verses 3 and 4? Sure. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scripture. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So as we look at verses 1 through 4, this is the introduction to this entire book. As you look at your quarterly, and as you go through it for this whole section on Romans. Don't just take the quarterly. Take your Bible. Take the quarterly. But also avail yourself of the distinctive teachings that this church offers concerning what we know to be the truth as found in the book of Romans. Because it's going to deal with the entire history of the Adventist church. This book that was written so long ago <coughs> We look back in the days of Luther and think, wow, that was a long time ago. But it was even longer that Paul penned these words. Did it change Luther's life? Yes. Did it change Luther's world? Yes. Yes. Will it change our world today? Yes. If you understand Adventist history, and you take this book, and you take what you learn from the book of Galatians, <clears throat> you start to get a clearer picture of where we are in time, answer some of the questions that are always asked of, like, why Jesus hasn't come back yet? What is he actually waiting for? What part do we play, and what does God expect from us? All those questions can be found answered here in the book of Romans, if you avail yourself of deeper study. If you just go by the quarterly and just look at the text they give you, you'll have a superficial knowledge of what's going on with that book, okay? You can't blame the author of this quarterly. It's very hard to put that kind of detail into something this short, you know what I'm saying? But the information is available to you if you just take the time and actually study it for yourself. As we look at Romans chapters one or chapter one verses one through four, let's look at chapter one verse one. You find out who wrote it, and that was Paul. Romans is Paul's greatest work. It's placed first among his thirteen epistles in the New Testament. While the four Gospels present the words and the works of Jesus Christ, Romans explores the significance of his sacrificial death using a question and answer format. Paul records the most systematic presentation of doctrine in the Bible. Romans is more than a book of theology. It is also a book of practical exhortation. The good news of Jesus Christ is more than facts to be believed. It is also a life to be lived. And that's what I hope that you get out of this study. 
That's what I hope that you got out of the study of Galatians. One of the problems in Christianity and in the Adventist church today, especially in the Adventist church, in the past we've always been really good at giving out information. And if we give out the right information, then we feel that we've done our job. But what I want you to understand is that the heart and the key to this book is not just information. It's actually a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what this has always been about. This is what was brought out in the study of the book of Galatians. That you can read this book, but if you don't become personally acquainted with the author of that book, it's going to avail you nothing. Amen. This is about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes. And this is about what Christ is able to do in you, through you, and with you. That Jesus Christ is waiting for a people that will reflect his character. And the only way that's going to happen is if they have him living in their hearts. Amen. Listen, this isn't complicated. And this is what you need to understand. This is why it's relationship-based. But you need to have a firm foundation in knowledge and truth of the scriptures. Okay? But if you grasp the hand of Jesus Christ, does he not promise that his Holy Spirit will bring you into all truth? Amen. Amen? All right. So as you continue to go through this book of Romans, hopefully every lesson is going to be Christ-centered. And you want to see Christ in everything that's preached and taught about this book. So, Paul says he was a bondservant of Jesus Christ. What does that word bondservant mean? Slave. Slave. Now, most people today, and even in Paul's day, would not have looked at that word as a good word. <laughs> or as a good title. But you understand that Paul... Paul exalted in that title because he understood that outside of Christ, he had no power. He knew what it was like to try to live and be saved by the law. And did it work for him? Did we not find that out in the book of Galatians? Okay, what was his final opinion about trying to save yourself by keeping the law? It doesn't work and that in the end, it was dumb, right? When he found the excellence of Jesus Christ and what he has to offer, everything in his past was worth nothing to him. Now you need to understand what that meant for him. Did Paul say that he bore the marks in his body for his teachings of Jesus Christ? He made plain that others didn't want to teach the cross because they didn't want to suffer persecution. But Paul was willing to die for what Christ has done for him. And he said he bore those marks in his body because he understood the excellency of Jesus Christ. This is what you and I have to understand and come to that same mindset. That Christ is worth more than anything your friends, your family, your job, or this world can give you. That there is nothing worth more than what Christ is able to do in you. But what is it that Christ is able to do in you? Everything. There are certain things I'm specifically looking for because this is where the, the churches and even now the Adventist church have gotten off course. What is the glory and the excellency of Jesus Christ? He brings us His righteousness and He creates His character inside of us. There is nothing more glorious than that. That's what drove Paul to be beat, to be stoned, to be shipwrecked, and finally to give his head for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because outside of Christ, there's no way that man can be saved. Amen. Do you guys understand that? But what Paul understood is that Jesus Christ is able to live his life inside of you and represent himself through you. You are able to show the world the righteousness and the love of God. Amen. What higher calling is there than that? 
our focus has been so much on sin and self that when you hear messages that you can actually overcome sin, you get all freaked out and you get all worried because you focus on, I can't do that, I know me. Okay. The problem is, is, no, not the problem, the answer to that is, you don't have to worry if you're in Christ. Okay. Because whose job is it to clean you up? You no. or Christ? Right. So if you are in Christ, are you going to still waller in the mud and pig pen? No. no. When you study Romans, you're going to get those specific questions. So if we're under grace, do we continue to sin? What's the answer to that? We read that, but why do we not live that? Because it's not making sense up here. Because our focus is on us instead of on Christ. Do you understand that? This is why the victory is only in Jesus. And Jesus has to be your all in all. He has to be everything. Because if he's not, then you're just a bunch of legalists. You understand that, right? So Paul, a bond servant. What does that mean? A slave. A slave of Jesus Christ. Do you know what that actually means in the reality of living your day-to-day -day life? It's not a bad thing. It's exactly what Deborah said. What did you say? Did you say that louder? Taking your orders from God. You spent 14 weeks hearing this over and over and over again. And you're going to spend another 13 weeks hopefully hearing the same thing. Hopefully it's going to start to make sense to you. And instead of just hearing it, you're going to be able to actually submit to God and allow God to do it in your lives. Isn't that what you actually want? Amen. Why do you come here every week? Fellowship's great. Food's good. No, I mean the food of the, the Word. Why do you come to the Adventist Church? Let me tell you something. Your life would be a lot easier if you went to a Sunday church. My life would be a lot easier. I know that. Why do I keep coming here? Why do I continue to be a second to Adventist? Love, truth, I want to be like Jesus. I've heard, I've heard, I've heard what God can do in me. I want to see that actually happen. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. And the thing is, is I have seen that happen. But I want to see it more. And I want to see it more. And I want to see it more. I want to see Jesus reflected in my life. And I want to see him reflected in your life. I want to be able to see and know that I belong to a church that isn't just a social club, that is actually filled with people who reflect the character of Jesus Christ, who will stand for the truth even if the heavens fall, who will say, here I stand, I can do no other. That conscience is more important to me than money. That conscience is more important to me than serving God. I got your vote for the life. That serving God is more important to me than anything in this world. More important than my family. More important than my friends. I want to know the excellency of Jesus Christ. Amen. So how do I do that? I do that by becoming a bondservant of Jesus Christ. That's step number one. If you haven't got to that point, Everything else is useless. You guys understand that, right? This is what Paul said. That's, that's step number one. This is what you need to become. A slave to Jesus Christ. Because if you're not there, everything you've heard for the last 14, 15 weeks will make no sense to you. On how to actually work that out in your day-to-day -day life. Submission to Christ is key to all of this. Yes, Edward. Uh, Galatians 1.10. You want to read that for us? For I do not, for do I not persuade men or God? For do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You can't be a man pleaser and a God pleaser at the same time. Wow. So in the end, 
you have to make the choice every day whom you're going to serve. <clears throat> because you need to realize that we think, well, I'm not being a slave to God. If you choose not to be a slave to God, you have chosen to be a slave to Satan. It's the only two choices you have. And that's what the world needs to understand. That's what young people really need to understand. You've got two choices. It's either God or it's Satan. Yes. There is no fence straddling here. It's one or the other. So, Paul is a bondservant, and in that role of a slave, he was able to be an apostle separated to the gospel of God. Do you understand that? When he was Saul, he looked at his pedigree, and that's what gave him his prestige and his title. When he saw the worthlessness of that, and he gave his heart fully to Christ, he became a slave to Christ, and that fit him to be an apostle. Guys, grasp that? He thought he was zealous for God. He was willing to kill Christians in his zealousness. But yet when he found out who God really was, he gave up everything. He became a slave, and now was fitted to be an apostle. Let that sink into the leadership here. Which God promised before, this is verse 2, which God promised before through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. Why did Paul put verse 3 in here? Is there any significance to this, or was he trying to fill up space? Show for our humanity. Yeah, he's your the incarnation. The incarnation, yes. Well, he was descended from Abraham, and he was part of mankind. He's a man. Is this verse important to us in our understanding of yeah. the gospel of exactly. Christ? What God is going to do for us? Without that, this is about to throw this book away. So it is very important, definitely. Proving that it was the Messiah that was promised to King. When we look at a verse like verse 3, concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, you have to look at verse 2, which talks about God's promise as it's contained in the Holy Scriptures. Is that right? So Paul is making sure that the readers understand that everything he says can be backed up by Scripture. That Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Savior of the world, has been promised from ages past, and now that promise has been fulfilled. And that can be backed up by Scripture. Isaiah 9, 6. This right here. Unto us a son is given, or unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. His name shall be what? Wonderful, yes. Counselor, mighty the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Okay? But... What does this verse have to do with us as Seventh-day Adventists? Anything? Well, the big deal about being born of the seed of, a, of David, proving his humanity, that he, as he overcame in the flesh, we can overcome in this, when we put to death our sinful nature, as he did. Very well stated. Well, um, I'd like to read some things here. Does somebody else have a, a comment? Keep thinking about this verse. What it has to do with us is that means. I'm going to get to that in a second here. <clears throat> the gospel is, or the gospel of God is concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, Romans 1:3. Read the history of David and of the kings who descended from him. Were they great people? <laughs> When you look at the heritage of Christ from David's side of the family, was there a lot of hereditary sin that was passed on? Yes. Is sin passed on heredi no. Her no. through heredity? No. Yes. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Okay, I got some people saying yes, some people saying no. Condemnation has been passed along with guilt. Has not been passed along. Let me ask you a question. If your daddy was a drunk, do you have to watch out with you taking up home? 
Because you also will suffer from the same thing. So is sin hereditary? Now, Ricky, what we're talking about is two different things. You understand what I'm saying? Well, I'm not talking about the condition of what you receive from Adam. What I'm talking about is if I'm prone to a sin, and my children grow up around all that, are they going to be prone to the same thing? Yeah. Will, my grand, will my grandchildren be prone to the same thing? Look at alcoholism as it goes through the family. Somewhere in uh, uh, Ezekiel verse 18, I see chapter 18, verse 20 says that the, that the son shall not be responsible for the father. That's not the father. what I'm talking about. Okay. Right. No. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. What I want you to think about is Christ. When it came to his human nature, what was it that he got from David? A lot of great things from his family's past? No. Or did, yes, Chuck? No, you're absolutely right. Uh, I hope no one is offended, but if you look up the word descendants or seed in your concordance, it's spermatos. <laughs> so that's yes. about as yes. direct connection to genes as you can get. Because you're going to get something from every person in your family. Right? And it continues on. Bloodline continues on. And that's all I'm wanting you to focus on here. Because as Adventists, what was the question? Does this verse have anything special to tell us as Adventists when it comes to Christ? Being of the seed of David. And I'm going to make a point here, and I want you to think about this. Okay? This is for, yes, Linda. It also shows that God is no respecter of persons. Very good. Very good. So, again, uh, the kings who descended from David, who became the ancestors of Jesus, if you look at their history, you will see that on the human side, the Lord was handicapped <laughs> by his ancestry. Do you believe that? Yeah, yeah. It was. Now, listen. I've explained this before, and I'll explain it again. I came out of the Catholic Church. And in the Catholic Church, the reason why you had Mary and so many saints is because Christ was so far away from you and so far above you, he could never know what it's like to be you, so you needed the intercession of Mary and the saints because Christ could have no idea what it's like to be you. I want you to think about that because this is why the lesson talking about Luther, says we are not to go back to Romanism. And you're going to have to ask, I'm going to ask you some questions, you're going to have to ask, answer them, you're going to have to ask the question as, do you agree with the Catholic Church on this teaching? Or do you agree with Scripture and the truth that have come out through the Adventist Church? And to clarify one more step, the reason that we have this word, Immaculate Conception, a lot of Protestants fall and think that Oh, Immaculate Conception, that means that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. But the, in the uh, Catholic theology, which if you study, it's just right there, in order to get Jesus an unfallen human nature, they managed to get Mary born unfallen human nature so that yes. her conception was Immaculate, <laughs> not Jesus. Well, uh, yeah. And that's what exalted her up to the position she Mary. is within... Which, which is why your understanding that he was so high up above you because he is taught did not share your nature was was born of a woman in the other place where it says that but then they changed what the woman was like to get yes. to not have to have this this conflict mm -hmm. in Jesus' life. Is this important? Yes. This is another foundational principle that everything that the Adventist Church has been raised to teach hinges on. We have to overcome as he overcame. And we're gonna get, you're, you're gonna get into that, and I'll, I'll briefly touch on that. But what I want to do is I want to continue to read this. I want you to think about these things, okay? So Jesus, on his human side from David, was handicapped by his ancestry as badly as anyone can ever be. Many of them were licentious and cruel idolaters. Although Jesus was thus compassed with infirmities, turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22. 1 Peter 2, verse 22. Who has that? Who let us read that? Okay. 
He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. This is to give courage to men in the lowest conditions of life. It is to show that the power of the gospel, the grace of God, can triumph even over heredity. And also, we show people like Dr. Phil, Oprah Winfrey, Joe Osteen, that you are responsible for your choices. It's not.